Welcome to Linux Fest. Welcome to the Choose Your Distro Adventure Talk. So, like I mentioned uh, <clears throat> before I started recording all of this stuff, uh, I originally called this the Choose Your Own Adventure Talk. Um, I was thinking like Zork and text-based adventures and things like that for those of you who are a little older. If you don't know what Zork is, uh, stick around afterwards. I'll tell you all about it later. But uh, the reason I changed this was there were some litigation matters going on with the Choose Your Own Adventure branding. Netflix was getting sued. Um, and I don't have Netflix money, so I'm like, we're just going to pretend that I never said that. <clears throat> Anyways, so uh, in any event, for all the uh, goofy people who will see this later who aren't here, um, I'll quickly explain what I just explained to you guys. I'm really sorry. Um, so we basically had some cards. We're picking a few distros. Sir, welcome. Come on in. Guys, perfect timing. Grab a card on your way in. Um, there are cards up here. There are pens. Grab those. Make your selections. We are going to be picking the distro today um, for what we're going to be talking about here in a minute. Um, we already have the winner for the moment, but please still complete it because if we have time in the talk, if I don't ramble away, um, we're also going to do step through other parts uh, that we didn't get to. So if your distro didn't get picked, don't freak out. We're going to hit as many of them as we can. Fair enough? So anyways... Uh, okay, so I don't have to redo that because guys came in on cue. Perfect. Thank you guys. I'll buy you lunch later. <coughs> that was perfect. So, all right. So, uh, so here's my narcissistic slide, um, which is a little bit about me. Um, well, sort of. It's almost a little bit about me. So, I'm a senior infrastructure engineer of the 777th degree. If you get that joke, I like you and you like Disney movies. Um, bachelor's degree from, it doesn't really matter, but yes, I did graduate university. Uh, master's degree in life, because master's. And PhD in yak shaving. Does anybody actually know what yak shaving means or get the reference? I ask this every year. No. No Ren and Stimpy fans? <gasps> you won't make me feel old. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, uh, all yak shaving is is doing the same thing over and over and over again. It is like shaving a yak. Um, and... So before I learned how to automate things and do other cool stuff, I got really good at doing the same thing over and over and over again uh, in my career. So, welcome, come in, join, grab, a, <coughs> grab one of the cards up front here. Fill that out, when you're done, uh, hand that over to Shannon. Shannon's waving at you actually right there. She says hi. I'll take um, cards yeah, she'll take those cards. You're not bothering me. You can move about the country here in the, in the auditorium, it's fine. You're not bothering me, I am not a speaker that freaks out about people moving around or asking me questions or stopping the talk. It's okay. I actually encourage you. So, <clears throat> here are the distributions that were obviously on the card that we picked a minute ago. Uh, according to Shannon, who can count much better than me, that's why she's the one who tabulated this, uh, Ubuntu Pop OS has won. So that is where we're going to start. Um, and like I said, don't freak out. We'll likely go back and do some other things. This is kind of hilarious since we do have uh, Popey in the audience, and I'm sure he didn't rig any of the cards. So everything's fantastic. He's, he's over there laughing already. So, let's see here. So Pop! OS and Ubuntu being its base. So Pop! OS it was created by System76. It's based on Ubuntu um, and by extension Debian. Obviously Debian is the grandfather of all of those distributions. Uh, utilizes the dev package format. Six month release cycle, so it is not a rolling distribution if you guys are familiar with that. Main difference is every six months you'll have a cadence. If you're on the long term support release, you'll have five or more years um, of support for that distribution if you really like setting things up once and just doing your thing, right? Um, however, six month release cycle, so if you would want to go say from one LTS to the next LTS, um, you actually can do that. You just have to upgrade to the interim six month release and then to the next release. This is actually the process I went through right before I came to this talk. I was on 1804, I upgraded to 1810, and then upgraded to 1904. For the record, it went flawlessly. <clears throat> it was like four commands. So anybody can do it. As a matter of fact, System76 on their website actually has a little one-pager on here's the four commands if you want to upgrade stuff. Super duper simple. Um, even though I don't recommend copy and pasting things from the internet and running it on your distro, uh, I I recommend you trust those guys. They made the distro. You're probably going to be okay. Um, don't do it on GitHub. Just saying. Um, so it uses the Advanced Package Tool or Apps Package Manager. 
And you'll notice down here that we have DE, that stands for Desktop Environment. Uh, we have GNOME, KDE, XFC, LXD, Mate, and Cinnamon. Why did I lay these out? Well, the answer is, is that that card was just the first part of the Choose Your Own Adventure. We've hit a fork in the road. So now that we've picked this, and I've told you just a little bit about this, which I'm going to go a little bit more into in a minute, um, we're going to pick the desktop environment you want to know more about uh, and how it relates to this particular operating system, or distribution rather. So, um, in any event, so a little bit more about Ubuntu. So Ubuntu is really, really cool. It's a very, very stable base. It has one of the largest package repositories of all of the Linux distributions. Some of the only ones out there I can even think of off the top of my head that would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with it for amount of packages and things of the like would be uh, Arch. Um, so, I mean, you know, that and the Arch user repository, also enormous. Pretty much between those two things, I feel like pretty close to anything that's ever been packaged or run on Linux kind of works. Um, another point of note, uh, Ubuntu also makes the, um, the uh, packaging around what the Steam client uses and things of the like. It's been around for a while. I know they're actually doing work on it um, to make it even better. But that said, um, I'll, pretty much if you are running Steam on a modern distribution, uh, some part of what you are running pretty much touches that Ubuntu bit that they made for all of us quite some time ago. Um, so really, you should thank them, buy them a beer, maybe give them a hug. Um, because they, made a, they, did a, they basically blazed a lot of this trail. Um, so I could say a little bit more about this for some other distributions we talk about, but I'll leave that for later. Um, so with this right here, um, um, with this right here, uh, does anybody have any questions around just this? Yeah, when you do the, uh, the upgrade for the system, does it blow away the whole system and then replace it, or is it just copy over the existing system? So the long and the short of that is, is basically it's an in-place upgrade. So uh, all of your files, all of your documents, all of your downloads, all of that delightful stuff is all hanging out. Now, I'm going to caveat that by saying I would recommend if you're upgrading any distribution for the love of God and all that's holy, um, please back up your home directory uh, and or anything you really, really, really care about. Now, I've been supremely lucky and a ton of work has gone into um, upgrades in general, um, especially over the last uh, several years. I have not run into any personal issues with doing this. That was not always the case. You know, there's also a subset of people that'll tell you, oh no, you're doing it wrong. Back up everything. You know, nuke and pave, blow everything away, install that. That's a valid option, it really is. Um, but personally, I, I, as I mentioned at the onset, I'm supremely lazy, so I, I generally do the in-place upgrade, and it has not bit me yet. Gentleman in the back, hold one second, Shannon's gonna come back with a mic, and she will make sure that we hear everything that is awesome about what you're about to ask me. Well, the biggest problem I've had with upgrades is it keeps telling me the partition is too small and it won't upgrade. So, so it definitely does, uh, you definitely do have to have a certain size partition, um, and you definitely do have to make sure that you have the requisite space to be able to do an in-place upgrade. Um, in those situations, you can resize partitions if you have the space and things got a little wonk out on you, but really, in that situation, I would probably recommend um, backing everything up to other drives or other storage and probably nuking and paving. That would be my personal recommendation as far as, th that's like the 45 second answer. There, I mean, there's a whole ph philosophical debate around that, but that's what I would tend to do. Um, but any other questions? Yes, sir. One thing I've encountered is if you go into the Etsy directory and you've made custom changes mm -hmm. to configuration files, sometimes yep. during upgrade, they'll have to merge those or clobber it. Mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendations on how to either the new config or your Etsy just say, hey, package manager, just blow anything I've done away, but then you have it backed up as well, where then you can go in and more uh, manually so do those changes. So I know that there are a couple backup utilities that exist, and I can't remember if it's Time Machine or Time Shift. Um, it's Time Shift. See, there you go. She just walked in. She already nailed it. Thank you so much. Um, so Time Shift. So Time Shift uh, focuses um, a bit more on um, actual settings and things of like in addition to just your storage. 
Um, so I would take a look at that tool and see if that'll meet your needs. I also know that there's, um, uh, I think Aptic is another tool, if I'm not mistaken, that will also, uh, I was looking at them last year, um, that will also do an excellent job of preserving your settings on top of just your files and whatnot. Um, and that's a bit more specific to um, Ubuntu and the Debian-based family. But if I'm not mistaken, I believe that pretty much any of those distributions, you'd be able to utilize that tool. Um, but it's super awesome. Um, I highly recommend looking at both of those tools. They will save your butt, and I will air my dirty laundry here. I am, I am supremely lazy, and I have not yet set this up yet, but that's because I'm in the process of setting up my own Nextcloud, uh, home NAS, and things of the like, so I haven't quite got that far yet. Um, I believe there's a question in the back. Yes, sir. Are you going to discuss any more about the desktop environments that you have listed there? Yes, sir. Yes, Excellent. I. Yep, absolutely. Oh no, we're we're just getting started here. I'm just getting wound up. Shannon will tell you this is me on. This is like the diet coke of me. I haven't even. We haven't hit tequila <laughs> ray yet, so we're getting there. So uh, now my next question to you guys, and I'm going to do this by show of hands because Shannon's already getting a workout, and frankly, I don't want to kill any more trees. Um, so uh, by show of hands, who would like to see gnome? Excellent. No one cares about. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. That's okay. So there were two gnome hands. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, KDE. Okay, got a got a hand for KDE. Uh, XFCE. Okay, I got two there. Got one once. Oh, uh, so, there you go. Okay, so I got I got a few. Right now, XFCE is in the lead. LXDE. Got one. Okay. Uh, Mate, because I don't want to get punched by Wimpy. He's here. Okay, so I see uh, three for that. So right now we have what? What is that? XFCE and Mate are in the lead. Cinnamon. Oh my God, Cinnamon won. Wow. Okay, I'm not judging any of you. I just super didn't expect that. Okay, just so it, I want you to understand my reaction. Okay, well, uh, let's hit up Cinnamon real quick. Okay, so a picture is worth a thousand words. I could have hit you with a million and one different technical details, but that's why I'm here and you bothered coming. Um, so Cinnamon's really cool. It's been around for quite some time now. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe it's one of the flagship... Um, shipping desktop environments for Linux Mint, which is not on this list. However, um, it is an Ubuntu Debian backed distribution. They have their own, it is its own thing, but it's still based on them and yada, yada, yada. But anyways, um, you'll notice it's a very Windows-esque experience. There's a bar at the bottom. There's something where a start menu would be, you know, things of the like. This is a really nice transitional desktop environment. It's not the biggest, fattest, bloatiest environment. It's not the smallest. So, but what's really nice about this is if you're coming over from a Windows experience and things of the like, um, a lot of the visual aesthetics are very similar, right, for what you are looking at um, and things of the like. So um, I would highly recommend it. Um, they've done a lot of work around stability and the like. There was a point where it was very crashy um, and very unhappy. Um, those days are kind of uh, somewhat in the past. But um, very, very cool desktop environment. Um, yeah, so uh, what questions, if any, do you guys have around this desktop environment? Yes, sir, hold on one second. Shannon is running back to you, and she's getting wind sprints today. Yes, sir. So, uh, can you like, apply themes on top of this desktop environment? Absolutely can. Yep. Make it look like, let's say you want it to look like Mac OS, is that possible? If you wanted to customize that in this way, I think you can actually get pretty close, actually, okay. um, if I'm not mistaken. Most of, the, most of the desktop environments we'll discuss are pretty flexible, especially where, especially where you want to put, um, you know, I'll call it the start bar, um, you know, or your panel. Um, most of them are pretty flexible with where you want to move that or if you want to hide it and in lieu of that, install docs, things of the like. Plank is pretty popular and things of the like as far as getting that dock-like experience, like you would get, say, in like GNOME or something of the like, that's a little bit more Mac feeling, um, or even in the elementary project, things like in their Pantheon desktop. So, okay, uh, any other questions about Cinnamon? No, everyone's looking like, no, no, we don't care. We're done with Cinnamon, right? Um, sorry, Gat. Oh, I was... <laughs> <laughs> How does it compare to like, a, you know, KDE has a whole bunch of built-in productivity tools and things mm -hmm. like that. Is this lighter, like more lightweight on that end of the thing, uh, of the spectrum? So, so I would definitely say that Cinnamon is um, less whiz-bangy uh, than KDE. 
However, uh, in KDE's defense for a minute, because I don't want to, I don't want to be mean to KDE you guys. They do some really cool stuff. Um, so they've done a ton of work around resources and things of the like. So it's a much slimmer experience than it once was. Um, so even though it's still considered one of the heavier desktops, um, I think that they're starting to challenge that paradigm just because um, they've done a lot of work to slim that down. Um, but I would say that Cinnamon is probably, um, I would say, slightly smaller than KDE if you were going to put a gun to my head um, and basically say, you know, is it or isn't it? Um, I would say it's, it, it is lighter on resources for sure. Um, okay, well, if there's no other questions on this, yes, sir? Um, yeah, I did have Cinnamon, and I switched to XFCE, mm -hmm. but then my welcome screen says I still have Cinnamon. Why is that? So, so uh, <laughs> whenever, whenever you start adding um, additional desktop environments when you already have one installed, um, you get into an interesting gray area, um, depending on the distribution that you're running. Um, where most of the time, you're not gonna have a problem. However, you are also setting up entire desktop environments next to each other. There are chances that things like that will happen. Um, it could have been, uh, without knowing more, it could have been something as far as the way it got installed, it could have been something that got um, messed up as far as the meta package that you might have installed to pull it in. There's lots of different factors and reasons that might cause that. Um, if you wanna stick around after the talk, we can absolutely talk about it more. Sounds um, like you're saying you don't know. Yeah, I, uh, so I'm saying that there are so many different reasons that that could happen. Uh, I don't know off the cuff. You are correct. Because um, there are many, many reasons that that could happen. Um, okay. So any other questions? Like a legal answer. What's that? I way? work with a bunch of lawyers, and the legal answer is it's Yeah, right. <laughs> which happens a lot. Which happens a lot. Yes, Master of Arch. I'm kidding. <laughs> Okay, so you said that this is not the heaviest one, it's not the lightest one, so what do you consider the heaviest um, desktop of the ones that were here? Of the ones that are here, um, if I had to pick the heaviest, um, I'm going to say GNOME and everybody at the GNOME project is going to shoot me in the face with a bazooka. Um, however, if we went by just raw startup, just a desktop environment, things of the like, I would argue they are. now. If I'm going to give you the political answer to that, to that question, um, a lot of it also has to do with the choices that a distribution makes with um, building applications, what they install, and things of the like. So ultimately, what it really comes down to, in addition to not only the desktop environment itself, it's what is starting automatically when I start up my distro. So it's not, you can't just blame the, de the desktop environment. It is a major factor in what your RAM usage is when you start up your distribution. Um, so that, that, that's more the political answer. But so, uh, so we've hit another fork. So we're now, obviously, we've kind of gone through cinnamon a little bit. We've answered some questions about it and things of the like. So now the question I'm going to pose to you guys is, would you like to go back and go through a couple of the other desktop environments, uh, specifically for uh, Ubuntu and Pop! OS? Or would you guys like to move on to uh, the next distribution that was voted up? You guys tell me by a show of hands. Uh, do you want to go back to the desktop environment? Show of hands. <gasps> one guy? Let's, oh, two. Oh, I got a mercy one. Okay. Um, and who wants to go back and uh, look at another distribution entirely? Okay. Fantastic. All right. We did have a meta question on the desktop environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So is it, is it possible to have different desktop environments per users, so that way when you log out as one user, you get back to your user selection, and then when you log in as another user, they're using an entirely different desktop environment? I believe technically, yes, you can customize that, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I believe you can go in and set those settings per user, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I don't know the, the technical detail off the cuff, but I'm almost 100% sure you can do that. Um, okay, very cool. So. Uh, so we are back to the, uh, the distro selection screen. Shannon has stolen what she had given me as far as what was uh, second and third place as to what we were going through next. So uh, bear with me just a second because I don't know what's next. Thank you, man. Um, okay, so the next... Really? <laughs> No, I'm genuinely shocked again. I, I, mm. Okay, then. So apparently everybody from OpenSUSE decided to join us. Uh, and um, 
Apparently, Open Sousa is now the second ranked. Uh, okay, so somebody put mint. Oh, I like whoever put mint. Thank you. So you thought about it. Okay, so uh, Open Sousa it is. So, so what's interesting about Open Sousa? Um, it was originally based on Slackware. Um, it provides a rolling release distro uh, called Tubbleweed and a long-term support release. And I'm sure that <clears throat> the various people there will probably smack me for calling it that, but which is Leap. Um, Leap's kernel is the same kernel released with uh, their commercial offering, which is Suzanne Enterprise Linux, which is pretty cool. Um, it uses, uh, utilizes RPM or Red Hat Package Manager, so that's basically their apt based on what we were just learning about Ubuntu and whatnot. So that's that's open source or uh, open source, open SUSE at a relatively high level. Um, there's a whole lot more that goes into Open SUSE. Um, it is arguably one of the most flexible distros that exist. I would say up there with Debian. And the reason that I say that is is that there is so much tooling and so many different ways you can implement OpenSUSE, depending on your needs. Um, it's just insanely flexible. Like, for example, if you wanted a day-to-day -day, uh, rolling release distribution like Tumbleweed, you're going to get the absolute bleeding edge packages for your development environments, for your various bits that you would want to work on. You're getting the absolute latest and greatest. Um, you know, sometimes even beating uh, Arch to throwing stuff uh, out to the world um, and things of the like. So they, it's extremely fast. So that comes with pros and cons. It's pretty stable. Uh, it usually doesn't have problems, but when you're, the very nature of dealing with such up-to-date packages lends itself to the con that you can very easily get yourself um, into trouble. I'll share a personal story with you about OpenSUSE. So um, I was running uh, Thunderbird for my mail client, and I was trying to set it up to work with Office 365, um, so that I could look at my work emails and do various other things. So I ran into uh, a tool called the DavMail Gateway. It's a little bit older now, whatever. It's basically a, think of it as a piece of middleware that basically does the communication between Thunderbird and Exchange. So it spreckens the Exchange and then translates it into Thunderbird Eats, right? Um, there was a insanely new version of Java that was in Tumbleweed's repositories that I didn't realize was like basically a dev build. Um, of Java, and it, the DevMail gateway wasn't ready for that yet. It usually tracks like a lot more stable versions, including Java. So it pretty much completely broke everything, and I didn't know why. So that turned into a lot of time and energy that I spent going down that rabbit hole and things of the like. Is that a day-to-day -day experience? No. Is Richard Brown probably going to smack me for saying that? Maybe. Um, but anyways... So that's kind of OpenSUSE in a nutshell. Um, if you would want to uh, a super duper long-term support release, something really stable, go with Leap. If you need cutting bleeding edge for your development and whatnot, go Tumbleweed. That would be my recommendation as far as like, which should you pick? Yes, sir, in the back. How is security in OpenSUSE compared to other distros? Uh, good. I, I, I mean, really, in a Linux distribution, <laughs> there, <laughs> there are various answers to security. I would say that innately out of the box with how things get patched and the cadence that that happens, you are innately on in a stronger stance um, than say someone running Windows in my opinion. We also have a much more, um, a, a much smaller attack surface I would argue than something like a Windows where a lot of people run that and it's uh, currently much more the enterprise and things like that. So if I'm a hacker and I want to attack something and get the most bang for my buck, I'm going to write something to attack the biggest and baddest thing in the world. Now that said, in the server world, Linux is kind of the king, right? So pros and cons, but again, I would still say a properly patched Linux system is still by default in a stronger security stance than a Windows machine. That's my personal feeling. I'm going to get so much hate for that, but that's my personal feeling. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> You're like, no, not really. <laughs> uh, yes, sir? Yes, how often do um, leap releases come out? So leap releases are approximately every two years. 
Um, it's not that exactly, but it's pretty close. I actually went back, I think the last at least two or three uh, leap releases were almost exactly right around two years. How long did they support them for? I believe they're five? Are they up to ten now? I would say, so, so my answer would be at least five. Yeah. So you're going to have that support for quite some time. And remember, too, you're also based on uh, their enterprise kernel. So we were talking about security a moment ago. So if you want enterprise level security at a kernel level, I would recommend Leap over Tumbleweed, in my opinion, um, for these, at least for this particular distribution. Um, any other questions? <coughs> yes, sir. I mentioned early on that this is using .rpm packages. Mm -hmm. Does it, is that compatible with packages for other distributions that use RPMs, like uh, Fedora or Red Hat or CentOS? Yes, yeah, so, so whenever we're talking package formats, for the most part, um, if I'm running an RPM-based distro um, and I get an RPM package, yes, it should work. Um, just like when we were talking about Ubuntu and Pop! OS earlier, um, that's a Debian-based uh, or a dev package format, right? So, for example, if I have, uh, you know, for the longest time, um, you know, what's an example? It's not the most open source thing in the world, but uh, Slack. Slack had a .dev package um, and whatnot. So you could double click on that, and it was kind of like the, I feel like it's kind of like an EXE. You double click it, it does the thing, everything's happy, magic, yay, I can run my application, right? Um, it's very similar for RPMs. Again, when you're dealing with those package formats and things of the like, um, anything that is of that format, you should be pretty much good to go. So um, whether it's OpenSUSE, Fedora, um, CentOS for that matter, yeah, you'd be pretty much good to go. Um, okay, so any other questions around OpenSUSE in general um, before we get into more of the desktop environments and things like Okay. Um, so, uh, hands for KDE. No love for KDE here, man. Okay. Um, uh, hands for GNOME. Okay, we got three this time. That's better. Okay, I must have beat up on them. Everyone wants, wants to hear about it a little bit more. Uh, XFCE. Ooh, everybody's interested in XFCE now. Okay, uh, Matei. Yeah. Okay, got one. Uh, LXDE. Okay, and Cinnamon. Okay, because obviously we did it already. Good. I'm glad everybody's paying attention. So, um, so let's hop over to XFCE. So this is XFCE. Um, you'll notice it has a very unique styling uh, by comparison. Um, XFCE has been around for a really long time. Welcome, come on in. Find a chair anywhere. Um, yeah, XFCE has been around for a really long time. Um, but you'll notice, even though that there's a panel at the top, um, there's the whisker menu there, um, and all kinds of really interesting things. But um, if you think about it, that's still kind of pretty close to a relatively traditional Windows start menu, right? Um, so uh, I know earlier when we were talking about other desktop environments, uh, can you theme it? Oh my god, can you theme this? This is not how most people's XFC desktop looks like. This screenshot is basically from their site, or pretty close. So most XFC desktops you, you look at will not look like this. Um, unless somebody really likes that, and it will. Um, but there's numerous dark themes, light themes. You can move where the categories are versus the items in that menu with a couple button clicks. Um, you can move this, the, the uh, search bar at the top to the bottom. You can, and that's just the, the, the whisker menu. That's not even anything else, right? We were talking about docs earlier. Want docs? Any doc you want will pretty much work. Uh, pretty close to in this desktop environment. Again, it's been around for a really long time, so they have tons of compatibility with things. Uh, we were talking earlier about how heavy or how light desktop environments are, right? So for argument's sake, if KDE and GNOME are at the uh, super heavy side of the scale, uh, XFCE is way down on the lower side of the scale. So a lot more of those resources um, are going to be going to your applications and things you're trying to do or compile as opposed to powering your desktop environment. If you want something greasy, fast, and snappy, great option. Um, so yeah, and there's a ton of folks, um, you know, in the open source community that love running XFCE. Uh, Joe Ressington is actually one of them. He lives, bleeds, eats, and, does, and defecates XFCE. But it's a really, really, really good desktop environment. Um, it's actually one of the first ones I used. 
So um, another little tidbit about XFC is, is that um, <laughs> there was a time, so I'm a very keyboard driven individual when I work with my distress, right? So I like hitting the super key and I like menus popping up and I like shortcuts. So for the longest time, XFC kind of sort of had super key support for the whisker menu. And then eventually one day it just stopped working and that was kind of sort of the same day I stopped using XFC a while ago. Um, but they have since actually fully supported the super key with launching things like the whisker menu and stuff like that. Is that gonna matter to everybody? No. Did it matter to me? Yeah, it was kind of a deal breaker for me it was super annoying. I'd be hitting there, I'd be sitting there hitting the button and I'm like, okay, well, I really want to launch something. Well, I guess I'll click on it. I don't really want to, but anyways. Um, so that's kind of the long and the short of XFCE. Question in the back. Oh no. Let's see, he's smiling. He's like, he's going to dodge another one of my questions. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. And actually, most, most of the desktop, or desktops, most of the uh, yeah, desktop environments I've been speaking about today, pretty much most of them, if not all of them, have that feature, or with minimal tweaking, you can get that feature. Um, let me say it that way. So yeah, you'd be pretty, pretty set. Yes, sir? I was just wondering how does um, XFC compared to LXD? So, XF, so basically, uh, they're kind of hanging out in the same bar uh, on the low resource side of the spectrum. Um, very similar. Um, uh, things I would put into that side of the spectrum, I would say like LXDE, XFCE, uh, Matei's kind of hanging out. He might be walking down the street to the bar while everybody else is there, kind of hanging out, waiting for him. Um, but they're all kind of very, uh, kind of in that same, uh, much more resource conscious end of the spectrum for desktop environments. So, um, you know, if you have older hardware or if that's a concern for you, again, another great use case for something like this. You're not losing any functionality uh, you just might have to put in uh, a monica more work to customize something to make it just the way you want, um, for at least some of them. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, so yeah, where, where did you classify um, Mate in, in that? Uh, is, is it medium? So I would say, I, I would say if, if XFCE and LXD are um, at the absolute light end of the spectrum, I would say Matei would be like the very next one. So I would say like lower mid. So if, so if middle of the road was like, ooh, never mind. I don't want to say middle of the road because I'm going to get fought no matter what I say there. So, so let's say if, if, um, if at 50%, right, on the scale of one, zero to 100, um, let's say Matei is probably in like the 35-ish percent percentile, and LXD and XFC are probably closer to like, you know, 15-ish. That's why I said they're kind of in the same neighborhood, okay. um, but I wouldn't necessarily say they're like, you know, in the bar yet. They're not like right there. They're pretty close though. Um, another question. Yes, sir. What are your, some of your favorite customization of what specific apps would you install to, to spruce this up a bit? To spruce this up a bit, so the neat thing is is that most of this um, is actually uh, stuff you can do without having to add a whole bunch of applications and to customize it, which is kind of neat. Um, so you can so all of the uh, bits I mentioned about messing with the whisker menu earlier um, that's not actually in another application. You can go right into XFC settings or rather whiskers uh, specific settings. Um, and you can just start mucking about with it and customizing the way it works, um, which is really neat. So as far as theming, so one thing we haven't talked about, which is pretty universal across all distributions, um, is the idea of downloading a theme and applying it to your system. So there are various pros and cons and caveats to that, but uh, if you go to like user share themes and things of the like, you can basically download a theme and it will be available to you in pretty much just about every distribution on Earth for you to go muck with. Now, there are different ways to interact with it based on your distribution. So for example, if we were talking about Ubuntu or Pop like we were earlier, um, there's actually a GNOME extension uh, that you can enable called User Themes that basically says, hey, you know that user share themes directory? Cool, look in there for all my cool stuff because I want to be able to do stuff with themes. And then you can go to um, your basically baked in, uh, well, it's not baked in anymore. Um, it never technically was. If you would install uh, GNOME Tweaks, you could then go in and basically say, hey, I want to go in and I want to set this as my theme, I want to set this as my shell theme, this, that, and the other thing. 
So it's super duper handy to do some of those things. Um, but yeah, so, so theming is something that's relatively universal as far as the background and how you do it. But depending on the desktop environment and the distro, it might change slightly with you know, a point and click way to your victory, if that makes sense. Um, but pretty much, like I said, most distributions uh, will have theming settings. You can go in, and the trick is to make it show up in the dropdown, and that's pretty much the user share themes directory, is where we'll make that show up, and you can apply it and see how full of a theme it is. Um, but yeah. So other questions for XOC? Yes, sir. Sometimes I get problems in theming uh, when applications launch and some of the settings don't display right. Mm -hmm. uh, where, or if there's a way to know which themes are uh, really, really supported and the ones that. So, so that's actually a great question. Um, so, oh, okay. How do I keep this relatively concise? No, I'm screwed. Okay, so um, there are different frameworks for desktop environments. So basically the framework uh, that GNOME uses, for example, is GTK. Uh, the framework that KDE uses is uh, called uh, Qt or Qt, right? So a lot of times you'll get, uh, where you'll get into a weird situation is I'm on a GTK desktop. So let's say I'm back to Ubuntu and Pop! OS. Um, and I have a GTK-based desktop and I'm running GNOME. Um, I download a Qt app and now all of my beautiful theming looks like trash on this one application. And it's white and it's hideous and I like dark <laughs> themes and it makes me want to cry and, and something's wrong, right? It's, I don't like this, this is ugly. So there are some tools out there. There's a Qt4 settings, there's also one for Qt5 as well. Um, they're in the uh, package repositories and they are point and click ways to help you fix that problem. Um, so you can go in and you can either set the settings within, um, like I said, the Qt4, Qt5 settings apps out there, um, and usually that will solve the problem. Um, if you wanted to dive even deeper, there are um, command line and config ways to go in and muck with specific applications. Um, Do you know that they talked about? Of the, of the app for, so I believe the, the, the Qt4 one, I believe is Qt4 settings. Um, the Qt5 one, the name escapes me off the top of my head. I know it exists, but if you literally search for like Qt5 or like Qt5 plasma settings or something like that, um, it will pop up um, in the repo. But that's what I would recommend. And so uh, the other fun part you'll get into is, uh, so the Qt app that I installed, oh crap, is this a, is this a uh, Qt4 or is it a Qt5 app? Because then the very next problem you're gonna run into is, is hey, that jerk said I can install the Qt4 one and it would work. How come it still looks like trash? Oh, well, it must be Qt5, bummer. Um, so it's a little bit harder to um, get into the nitty gritty. Um, so usually at that point I'll say, you know, open the application, go to the help or the about, and sometimes you'll get lucky and you'll see the version of Qt that it was running um, to at least help you out. But that would be where I would start. But um, that's also part of the reason, so I mentioned earlier I'm running uh, Pop! OS, um, and that's part of the reason I actually usually run that is because um, their pop theme and a lot of the theming they do is one of the most comprehensive and complete I've, I've seen um, since the, like, uh, it's called the Edwaita theme um, that's built right into GNOME. Um, it is one of the most complete themes I've ever seen. And I know they actually have a team constantly working on it, so I have a very uh, strong confidence level in that continuing and becoming even better. Um, so that's, yeah, that's why I'm a huge fan of that. Um, you had a question up here. Yeah, um, do they still have a GNOME tweaks online, uh, that website where you download? Oh, you mean, as far, oh you, uh, you mean as far as uh, the, the GNOME tweak tool, the actual application? No, it was like a website and it had everything from oh, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, theming of the thing. What is it? Uh, GNOMELOOK.org. Yes, yes, it still exists. Okay, yes, it does. Yes. Um, that's actually a great resource. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, it's actually a great resource. There's also one for KDE as well um, that you can go out there and you can pick the various uh, frameworks, you know, from KD4, KD5, um, same thing with uh, various uh, versions of GTK. You can also get um, shell themes as well. Um, in addition to your theming for your desktop, you can also theme the actual GNOME shell itself, things like that. So yeah, those are great resources for theming and uh, mucking about with making it look cool. Absolutely. So, okay. So we talked about XFC. Does anyone have any more questions about XFC specifically? 
Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go with no. Um, do we want to uh, tackle another distro or tackle another desktop environment? General distro. <laughs> distro? I'm, yeah. I'm hearing distro. Well, we, well, we change that as a general question. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, could you speak to like a three D accelerated desktops? I know, like you know, ones you can like spin it on a cube and mm -hmm. things like that, and mm -hmm. how they might be okay. compatible with yeah, comp is or, or barrel. Those. Mm -hmm. uh, I know those were really popular for a while and kind of died down. And I, I'm curious if you just comment on the state of that. So, uh, yeah, the sexy cube, cube is kind of dead, um, at least a little bit. Um, oops, there you go. Um, so the sexy cube is kind of dead uh, for, for most modern things for the most part. Um, it's been replaced by other uh, compositors and things like that that are usually a bit more sane with resource users and things like that. Um, can you still technically use those things? Yes, if you fiddle enough with things, yes, you can absolutely still get Compass to run on certain, uh, certain types of distros or more dated uh, types of versions of those distros. Um, yes, it, it, it is also very, very exciting to occasionally see you clicking on something and watching things just burn in fire as you click on them and stuff like that. Um, it's super cool. Um, personally, I, I, I miss that sometimes because uh, to me that was one of the first things, the whiz bangy things that attracted me to Linux is just like, oh, that looks awesome. I want to be able to do that. Wait, that thing's a cube? cube on my desktop. I mean, that was basically back when, like, you know, tab browsing was, like, some brilliant new genius concoction by someone. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. So, the short answer is not really, um, unfortunately. I, w I wish it was more interesting than that sometimes. Um, is there anyone who has an attorney in their building card? Oh, yeah. If you could determine the next... Oh, there you go. <laughs> Beautiful. Sorry. That's okay. All right, so we are, uh, so since everybody's excited about distros and all of light, um, like I said, Shannon is the math genius, I am the doof, so I will, I will defer to her with what we are doing next. But, um, so, uh, I'm trying to think, what else is going on? I'm trying to think if there's anything else super duper interesting about XOCE. It might have escaped me while she's finishing that up. Something too super crazy, but in any event, yeah. Uh, like I said, uh, and uh, for example, uh, we were talking about compilers a minute ago. So uh, we uh, are not compilers. We we're talking about compositors rather. Um, in Mate, they actually have Compton and things like that, and, and one, it's just more resource efficient things of the like. Yes. So um, a lot of the folks that came in later mm -hmm. wanted to talk about Ubuntu. So I don't know if you want to go. Back and show that a little bit. Okay. Or if you're gonna say, hey, wait until this comes out and watch me on YouTube. I'm not. I'm not that mean. But I'll. So I'll do this. Let's do. What was the next one? And then we'll swing back to uh, Ubuntu and Pop OS because I can talk about that all day. So, so Debian. Debian. Okay. I can do Debian. You guys are really throwing me curveballs. I was not expecting to talk about some of these distributions, and it's kind of fantastic. So okay, so Debian, uh, the granddaddy of the Deb, um, so to speak. So founded by Ian Murdoch in 1993, uh, was named after uh, himself and his eventual wife Deborah. Uh, utilizes the Deb package format, as I was rattling on about earlier. Um, it also uses apt, uh, just like Ubuntu, which is great. Um, the uh, release cycles for this is also roughly about two years, um, so a little bit more similar to OpenSUSE and the like. Um, and this, uh, one, one of the uh, taglines for Debian is the universal distro. Um, it, is, it is said by them they are one of the most flexible distributions on the planet. Um, there's also I could fill up many, many more slides on the different versions of Debian that exist for just about every use case on the planet. Um, and when I say that, I'm not really exaggerating. So there's, there is Debian for science, Debian for education, Debian for music, Debian for, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Raspberry Pi. What's that? Yeah, Raspberry Pi stuff. I mean, there's just, it, there's almost no limit to how you can basically massage this to meet your needs. Um, and uh, this is where um, you know Ubuntu is actually based off of Debian, right? 
Um, so if you want a stable, rock-solid distribution, uh, admittedly, the packages are a little bit old, but you need something that you can shoot with a shotgun and know is going to live, Debian is your distro. Um, that's why a lot of people actually will use it for home servers and stuff of the like as well. Um, so, yeah, Debian is rock solid. They also have an, um, a testing and unstable repo. And if I'm not mistaken, I can't remember if it's testing or unstable. Well, help me out. Which one is Ubuntu based on? Do you remember? Uh, it depends. <laughs> uh, <laughs> See, it's not just me. See, you saying the same thing? No, I'm just kidding. If, if it's an LTS release Ubuntu, it's based off of the, usually based off of Debian testing. Yeah. And if it's a non-LTS, the interim release is based off Debian unstable. There you go. So directly from uh, a gentleman, directly from Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. the, as if I planted him there. No, um, no, thank you much. So, um, yeah, again, it, it all depends on what you want to do. And it depends as kind of the motto of this talk a little bit, right? It's, you know, here are all these fantastic distributions, and we're all diving in head first, and there's so much to go through and so many desktop environments, so many permutations of all these things. The question you really have to ask yourself is, what do I want to do, right? What, what problem am I solving? Right? What, what, what am I trying to do? Um, why am I here? Right? So to speak. Um, but yeah, so, uh, but again, that's, uh, again, all of these are very, very much, very quick snapshots of these distros. Any one of these distributions, I could spend a month on. Like just telling you everything about them. Um, so we got two questions. We're going to go up here real quick, then we're going to hit you in the back. I promise I won't hit you. You mentioned that Debian is really rock solid yes. for servers. That's the same reason I might use CentOS. How would you compare the stability of those two uh, systems? Um, I, I feel like they're both really large grocery chains and they're both really good at what they do, right? It's um, for some of the older folks in the audience, it's Macy's and Gimbel's, right? I mean, it's, um, it's uh, ooh, well, that's a Pittsburgh reference. Never mind. I was going to say it's Foodland and Giant Eagle. Nobody will get that. Um, you know, it's really two great companies that are both super stable um, and are going to give you rock solid performance. Um, so CentOS though is the non-commercial version of Red Hat. So I would say if I wanted to do true apples to apples, I would say Red Hat is to Debian like, you know, um, CentOS might be um, more towards Ubuntu in my opinion. Again, Popey is going to punch me in the face for saying that because that's not true apples to apples. Um, I'd go the other way around. You would go the other way? Yeah. So, but point being is, is that um, you're going to get a rock solid experience from Red Hat, CentOS, um, from Debian's, things of the like because that's what they're focused on. People who want to use those distributions are looking for that stability and to know that when they run something, it's going to work, right? Um, so I would put them, uh, again, to use the bar reference earlier, if they were all in the same bar, I would say they're all kind of hanging out having beers in the same bar. Um, so they're definitely all in that same thing. Yeah. Yes, sir? You asked what you want to use it for. Well, I'm one of those, I want to use it for everything. Photography, family genealogy, GIS mapping, architectural design, mm -hmm. what distribution would be the most likely one, and I'm not concerned about the hardware requirements, mm -hmm. that would do everything I want. Uh, I would recommend either, to start, um, I would recommend either Ubuntu or Pop! OS specifically. That's, uh, on my, th that's my honest answer to you. I would, I would start there because um, it is going to get you off the ground and up and running uh, arguably faster than some of the other distributions we highlighted that are super flexible. So we're trading off a little, a monicum of flexibility for getting you up and running a little bit faster and being a bit more um, user-friendly as you're, yeah, well, well, being a bit more user-friendly as you're getting started. So for example, if you, if you had a problem that you were running into for one of those um, particular uh, tasks that you're trying to accomplish or complete, right, um, you are going to be able to literally fall over yourself Googling anything for Ubuntu or Ubuntu-based distributions online. Um, I mean, you just are. There's also quite a, quite a lot of wikis and resources very similar to the Arch Wiki um, that are out there that are just absolutely fantastic um, for that. And the, the reason I mentioned Pop! OS is, is that that's one of the things that they're, they're trying to strive for is 
people like makers, creators, people who are looking to do all kinds of different things. They're trying to help create that environment along with their Ubuntu base to create that environment in an approachable way for that person, if that makes sense. Um, so most people, if they would ask me like, where should I start my journey? I usually say there, because that's where I started mine. Um, I started way back when, when um, uh, I had a Broadcom chip, wireless chip in an old laptop and I had to plug it into a wired connection to get the proprietary blob, blob to be able to use my wireless, to be able to use my laptop the way I wanted to. You know, today we kind of take those things for granted. Um, so yeah, that would be my recommendation. I think there's one other question in the back. Do you like recommend a website that helps troubleshoot answer the problem with Debian let's start like a bunch of is like a specific website? So so I would <laughs> Stack Overflow. No, um <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm waiting for someone to throw something at me. No, um no, yeah. Um I don't know if there is one specific resource for you. Um at that point, like I said, Debian along with Ubuntu and things of the like. You're going to find literally DuckDuckGo and Google are your friends. Well, less Google, more DuckDuckGo um, are your friends, right? Um, so yeah, um, but like I said, um, I know Ubuntu has a wiki. Um, I know that they're, like I said, anything you run into for things of like, Debian has gobs of documentation you could spend months going through. Um, they have tons of docs. So I would recommend honestly going to Debian's actual website um, is gonna be the, the place I would direct you first. Um, and then from there, honestly, you're going to be, you know, duck, duck, going, Googling, things of the like. Um, it's part of the fun. So, other questions? Everyone's like, you've tired us out, right? Go away. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, um, what was I going to say? So, as far as desktop environments we haven't gone over yet, um, what? We have GNOME, we have LXDE, Mate, Budgie. Pantheon. Um, so show of hands, GNOME. Everybody gave up on GNOME. Okay, uh, LXD. Okay, we got a couple LXD, cool. Uh, Mate. One for Mate. Budgie. Ooh, Budgie might have won. Pantheon. Okay, okay. Cool, so I think, I think Budgie edged you guys out on LXD, I'm sorry. Um, so let's go Budgie next. Pantheon was a close second. Pantheon was a close second, I agree. So this is the Budgie desktop, um, and this is straight from uh, Solus's website, ironically. So they're who actually make the Budgie desktop. Um, so this exciting guy that popped out over here, this is actually, uh, oh, I believe they call that Raven now, if I'm not mistaken. But it's basically a side pop out. It has all kinds of really cool applets and things you can do in here, including managing music and whatnot. Um, so... Again, you'll notice this kind of tracks with a similar theme to um, cinnamon and the like. Um, so, what's that? Oh yeah, oh, now I'm in trouble. So what everybody doesn't know right now is, is that Shannon actually took a screenshot of this desktop because this is what she's running on her uh, laptop right now, and I forgot to add it to the presentation. I am gonna be sleeping on the couch in the hotel tonight. Um, so you can all enjoy thinking about that later when you're eating lunch laughing at me. Um, but anyway, so. My background's much prettier. I and mean, I gave you guys more to look at because I pulled up like the the start menu and the about. See, I told you I'm in trouble now. See, the, she does math better than me, and I'm in trouble because I didn't add her picture. <laughs> so, um, but uh, as Shannon mentioned, uh, so you can't see it in this particular picture. But if you would click on the grid in the bottom left hand corner, um, it kind of makes you think almost like uh, hitting something on an Android phone and it pops up your apps menu and things of the like. The, the start menu and whatnot looks very similar to uh, XFCE, I would argue, um, in that respect, although it flips around the categories and does some of the stuff I had mentioned earlier by default, which is pretty cool. Um, it's super duper fast. And we have a question in the back. Yes, sir. So in all of the screenshots that you've shown so yep. far, I haven't seen a single icon on the desktop. I was just kind of wondering uh, what the icons situation is on the desktop? So, so the short answer is yes, you can absolutely put uh, icons well, on your desktop. Back to the people that have added <laughs> <laughs> I have a icon on my desktop because I work, uh, my work laptop is Windows, and I have Windows on my desktop. Yeah. So I have a lot of icons on my desktop. Um, 
Um, and I'm over here, I'm like, well, I constantly use, you know, like, uh, we, have, we play League of Legends. So I'm like, I want a direct icon to get me to League of Legends. I don't feel like that's my own person stuff. So if you don't set, like, if it doesn't come with, like, a set icon, it gives you this little call to you. <laughs> and you can label them. Um, and you can move them around. But yeah, it, you can. <laughs> So I'll just hijack the presentation. <laughs> I was just going to say, so so now that you all know, I am not going to stop hearing about this until I come back next year. Um, and at that point, she's going to be in charge of screenshots. Um, okay. But, um, yeah, the short answer is on pretty much every desktop environment, um, yes, there is a way for you to get uh, icons on your desktop uh, for the most part um, in one way or another, whether they really want you to do it or not. But, yes, the short answer is yes. It's, it's actually very easy to do. Um, in GNOME specifically, it's, uh, I believe there's actually a setting for it. You can literally turn on, you can even say uh, the types of icons you do or don't want. Like for instance, like you're like, you know, maybe you're a guy who you're like, I really like the trash can. The trash can makes my day. Turn that on. Or maybe you want to see the networking icons mounted like uh, network attached storage devices, things like that. You can turn any of that on or off uh, piecemeal, which is pretty cool. Yes, Alan? That was true up until last month. And I removed it. Oh no. Oh, did they seriously? Yeah. Wait, did, wait, is that officially gone? Yeah. I didn't realize that had happened already. Um, so in Ubuntu, we ship an extension that allows you to put icons on desktop. It's not as full featured as how you could do it previously. Yeah. You can't drag an icon onto the desktop. That's, that capability is not there yet. But yeah, no one removed it, so we put that. Yeah. See, yet another re see, Ubuntu's looking out for it. I'm just saying, right? I mean, it's, it's he's, he's a, for those of you who can't see, yes, he's nodding his head in firm, confident agreement. Um, but yeah, so I didn't realize it did that already. I thought that was coming. I didn't realize it was done. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, like I was saying, in Budgie, again, very, very interesting. So we're talking about theming and things of the like. Okay, so for this desktop environment, um, its real true home is on Solus, um, which we haven't talked about yet. Um, that said, uh, there's an Ubuntu Budgie version, and they're doing some really cool work with that. Um, and there are some other kind of community-driven things. So it's not quite as portable as some of the other environments yet. But again, it also hasn't been around that long. Um, so it's still relatively new, but I would argue it's still very stable considering that, um, which is really cool. I believe you had a question, sir. Yes. Uh, in what category do you uh, put Budgie on? Middle, uh, middle, low, uh, because their first and uh, first releases were really bad. But I mm -hmm. just uh, the, the first releases and boom, almost like uh, LXDE. Yeah. Um, and does it uh, does it use uh, GTK? Uh, so I would put Budgie right around earlier when I said I was going to get in trouble with that fifty percent mark. I would put Budgie right around 50-ish, 60 -ish percent, would be my argument. Um, there are people who I know will disagree with me on that. However, from a responsiveness and a snappiness, at least my perceived snappiness of this and whatnot, I had very similar experiences to you. Things were incredibly snappy, they were very quick. The first person um, was snappy. Yeah, exactly. Um, it was pretty easy on resources. It is definitely 100% uh, lighter than GNOME, which is ironic because it was originally GTK. I know that they're also doing some work, or were at one point, doing work on porting it to uh, Qt. They were actually going to move it over to Qt for that framework. Um, I'm not currently sure where they are with that development on their roadmap currently. But to my knowledge, today, it's still, I believe, GTK. Though I know they've done quite a bit of work to move it to QT. Um, I, but I'm extremely interested to see what happens with this desktop environment and if it stays as responsive and snappy as it is and was. Um, uh, Solus is the only one that is working on Budgie, mostly, right? Them and the, uh, the Ubuntu uh, Budgie team. So there, is, so there is a team dedicated uh, to basically having that ported over to Ubuntu and things like that. Um, so they're also actively working on Budgie as well. Good question. Any other questions? No? 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 Okay. 
Um, so, um, if nobody else has any other questions for Budgie, um, is anybody going to fight me if I go back through and talk about Pop and Ubuntu one more time for some of the folks who came late? <laughs> I was going to say, no, no one's threatened me yet, so I'm guessing that's okay. I know Popey's super sad I'm going to be doing this. But anyways. So yeah, so, so for some of the folks that came late, um, so Ubuntu or Pop OS, so the Pop OS version, um, it's based on Ubuntu. It was created by System76. Um, they are here today. I, I missed that on the first go around. You should go talk to them and say hi. Um, so based on Ubuntu, which is based on Debian, as we went over earlier, um, utilizes the dead package format. Um, it has six month release cycles. The LTSs are supported uh, for five years, uh, which is kind of fantastic. And uh, you can absolutely upgrade um, from one LTS to another per se. Say if I'm running 18.04 before I came here, I upgraded to 18.10, which was that six month release. And then I upgraded to 19.04, which is the current LTS. Can totally do that. What's that? You're like, no, no. Oh, it's not? No, every two years. Oh, I'm sorry. See, this is why he's here. He's keeping me on. Totally yeah, yeah, it's 100% why he's here. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so it uses the uh, advanced package tool or app package manager. Um, so again, um, really, really cool. Um, it has one of the most uh, complete sets of theming um, I've ever used. Um, it's called Pop Theme. They have really cool dark themes, really cool light themes. Um, I really enjoy using it. Part of the reason I use it is because it just works. Um, pretty much for the most part, and I am supremely intelligently lazy. And by intelligently lazy, I mean I want things to just work, and I don't want to have to think about them more than I have to, right? Um, that's why I say intelligently lazy. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, I guess, does anyone have any questions who came late around any of this? Because I know some people are seeing this for like 1.5 times now. Um, Is it good for gaming? Was that, yes. Yes, it absolutely is good for gaming. Uh, was it good for gaming was the question. Uh, yes. The answer is it is good for gaming. Um, pretty much would not have a problem with it. Uh, all distros are pretty good at gaming, but I would, well, for the most part. But I would say that Ubuntu is definitely one of the um, best distributions for gaming. Um, there, there's a few that I would highlight, but Ubuntu is definitely one of them. Um, and Pop OS specifically, yeah. Yes, sir. So Pop OS and normal Ubuntu. So <clears throat> the good news is Alan is right there. So if I get any of this wrong, he is going to smack me so hard. Um, for, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. Um, <laughs> no, I'll just listen. I'll just buy him a beer later. It'll all be okay. Um, so uh, I would say the primary differences with Pop OS and Ubuntu are they make some different choices about things that are installed versus not. Um, it, w the Pop OS version will come with the pop themes out of the box. They will also come with a subset of GNOME extensions that they really like. Um, and some are convenience, some are not. For example, one thing that drives me a little crazy um, with those extensions are there's a user themes extension that isn't installed by default, which drives me nuts and, the, it, nuts and I mentioned it to them. So remember earlier I was talking about theming. You can, you can go into drop downs and pick themes and whatnot. Until you enable that extension, you can't change the shell theme for the actual like GNOME shell if you're using it by default. That drives me a little crazy because um, I feel like it should. But um, so I would say that they make different choices um, around some of those things. There's also a few other things that um, that they have or have worked on that I don't know as are in um, kind of the upstream yet. So for example, um, if you have um, an Intel and a NVIDIA GPU. There's actually tooling built in that you can actually, with a button click, and I believe last time I did it at least, it, was, it involved a restart. With a button click and a restart, you can pick between your Intel or your NVIDIA-based GPU. That's kind of a big deal, right? And we were talking about gaming earlier. Um, that can be a major pain point if you have multiple GPUs, right? Um, well, maybe I want to you know, run my NVIDIA GPU because I need every last scrape of FPS on game X, Y, or Z, right? Versus, oh, I don't want to use my, you know, built-in Intel stuff. Mm, mm, I don't want to deal with that. So, but that makes this really, really easy. Does that mean you can't do it on other distros? No. But are they actively making tooling around trying to make this easy? Yes. 
Um, they also have some um, power plan management tools. So similar to like uh, what folks have on Windows and whatnot, there's a performance mode, there's a balance mode, and there's a battery mode. And it's literally button clicks. And it changes the, the um, power performance ratio on your machine. That's kind of cool, <laughs> right? Um, so again, not all those things have necessarily made it into upstream yet, but um, I would say those are some of the highlights of things that um, set it apart, in my opinion, um, versus um, stock of Ubuntu. So, yeah. um, other questions? No, no other questions. Okay. What's that? <laughs> I was going to say, really, you're taking pity on Shannon because she was uh, running back and forth so much. So, I think some of the only uh, environments we haven't talked about yet, the desktop environments are, I don't think we've hit GNOME, I don't think we've hit LXD or Mate, and I think we also have, um, we haven't had the slide up, but uh, Pantheon, I think are the only desktop environments. We haven't done KDE, actually. We have not, we have not done KDE yet. Um, so, hands for GNOME, pretty sure everybody still hates GNOME. Okay, oh, I'm sorry, two people don't hate GNOME, I'm sorry, I stand corrected. Um, KDE, okay, we got some KDE. Uh, LXD, okay, I think LXD is probably going to win. Mate. Okay. All right, so, we're gonna, so I think we're going to hit LXD then. Okay. So, <laughs> so everybody who, uh, anybody who knows kind of the background of LXD and LXQT and things that are like, are probably going to throw things at me. They're going to be like, why does that say LXQT? Well, here's the thing. Uh, <laughs> So I'm going, to, I'm going to mess up at least some of this because there was a lot of history behind this. But basically there was a merging and melding of product, or products, projects. Um, and LXDE is the more legacy version of it. LXQT is more the newer version of it. Um, so LXQT is obviously based on QT, hence why QT's in it, right? Um, and there are, <coughs> it is definitely on the lower end of the spectrum when we were talking about resources earlier. I know everybody's kind of interested in that. It is very, very, very much on the lower end of the spectrum of resources. So it would be phenomenal for something like uh, um, me and the uh, gentleman in the front here who loves Arch, we're talking about like Raspberry Pis earlier or something like that. This would be phenomenal uh, from a resource perspective for something like that. Um, but something, even something like uh, Mate is great on Pies. Um, I know, uh, Martin Wimpress and his uh, team have been doing tons of work on that actually recently. Um, so that's doing really great. But um, in any event, uh, this is definitely um, a much more, again, Windows-ish Windows -ish experience. It's much more XP-ish, right, if you think about it. There's much more like start menu -y. oh look, there's my icons, oh look, there's my things that are open, oh look, here's my, here's my app icons, yada, 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 things of the like. So it was, um, you know, it was and it is um, an extremely efficient desktop environment um, and it's excellent for things that are aging hardware as well. So again, if resource consumption is a really, really big concern of yours, right, with whatever you're trying to accomplish, this is a great desktop environment for you guys. And it's very, very portable. Um, so this, you can put this on darn near anything. Um, it's extremely portable. So. And again, um, it's going to have a very familiar feel. You're going to not have a ton of issues with it. It is very stable, and it's very light. So uh, any questions around this particular desktop? I'm going to go here, and I'm going to go there. You mentioned portability. How portable is it across? Are we talking about distro portability? Correct. OK. Yeah, across distros. Correct. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, this is very, very portable across distro. A lot of distro support, things like this. So uh, what's the minimum requirements and um, the ceiling on, the on this one? Uh, because uh, the problem of uh, applications, mm -hmm. uh, uh, visual yeah. management, ceiling. Uh, right. So, so a lot of these, so again, so theming is a little bit more challenging on this, um, going back to pretty much what you're highlighting, obviously, right? Um, you can still theme it. Again, user share themes is still your friend. Um, and you're probably going to have to install at least a couple of those 
um, Qt uh, settings manager, as I mentioned earlier, um, to probably at least give you a point-and-click way around at least some of this. Unfortunately, there's not a great there's not a great built-in way to handle that at the moment. As far as the the absolute minimum requirements, I don't know them off the top of my head. I actually don't. Um, but I do know it is extremely light. Um, pretty much any, not anything, but um, I would say probably anything, <laughs> anything that can run a modern distribution or even a semi-modern distribution of Linux, you would probably have absolutely no problem from a resource standpoint, honestly. So I mean, you'd be pretty good to go. I mean, unless it was something absolutely archaic, I would be shocked if it didn't run this. So, any other questions? No, yeah, yes, no. Okay. So, so if we go back to the distributions, uh, I guess at this point, um, what would be the next distro you guys would want to talk about? Uh, how about elementary OS? Okay. Uh, what about Solus? Okay. Crap, that's like even. Uh, Manjaro. Okay. So I got one or two Manjaro. Uh, how about Fedora? And one Fedora. Okay. So I feel like I need to flip a coin between elementary and Solus. Um, I have a runoff. What's that? Runoff election. Yeah, right? <laughs> So, yeah, all right, let's do that. So we'll, <laughs> we'll give everybody what they want. So <laughs> um, let's start with elementary. Oops. Ironically, they're next to each other. So elementary OS is based on the Ubuntu LTS and by extension Debian. Um, they pretty much track the LTS versions whenever they're doing releases. Um, <laughs> The release cycle is literally when it's ready, and that's pretty much what the developers actually say. <laughs> they will release it when it's ready. Um, utilizes the dev package format. Uses uh, apt like pretty much all the other Debian and Ubuntu based re uh, distributions. Um, and they have a very strong aesthetic and Mac-like feel. Um, Pantheon is their only desktop environment currently that I'm aware of. Um, Pantheon's pretty cool. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it is GCK based. Um, but the developers have a very strong vision about what they would like the, their distro and their desktop environment to be. So if you wanted something that is going to make it supremely difficult to hurt yourself, this is a great distro because there are only um, a relatively minimal amount of things that you can adjust beyond theming and things like that. But the things you can adjust they make incredibly like rock dumb simple to change. So like for example, if you're like, I really like dark themes and I'm not a big fan of light themes. Okay, well you can go in and probably with about two button clicks you can do it and you're pretty much good to go. Um, and since they're very, very um, focused on the aesthetic of their desktop environment, you're going to not run into a lot of the QT you know, uh, versus GTK type theming issues you would run into otherwise. You're still gonna run into some of them, but they're gonna make this as complete as possible. They're very um, uh, System76 like in that respect with their theme, right? Um, so if you've ever used a Mac or if you're coming over from a Mac uh, environment or something of the like, this will feel like home. It will. Um, and I mean, I'll, I'll show you the desktop environment in a moment, but when you look at it, you're gonna be like, oh, that's not Mac? Oh, okay. Um, but it really does put you in that mindset. So if you, if you think that way, if that's where you're kind of at home, um, you're going to feel really at home on an elementary OS. Um, yes, sir, question in the back. So performance-wise, how does elementary OS with Pantheon perform? Like, uh, how resource-intensive is it? Um, it's actually really snappy. Um, it, it, it is not like a huge hog um, on resources, and it looks really nice. It, it's actually a pretty good balance. But again, this is why earlier when I said, oh, that 50% on that scale, I'm going to get fought because there are so many different things that are kind of in that realm, and so much development is going on into trying to make things more resource uh, efficient these days, at least from a desktop environment, in my opinion. Um, you know, it, yeah. 
there's a lot of good things that are happening on that. So you don't need to have 32 gigs of RAM to be able to just run your desktop environment. Thanks, Windows. Um, but I mean, who said that? So, yeah, I mean, so uh, I, I would say that, you know, a, a reasonably powerful low to mid-end machine would have zero issues running this. I would even venture to say that if you have even a slightly dated machine, you're still not going to have a problem. Um, yeah. it would, you'd be in really good shape. But um, are there any questions around kind of the basics here with elementary OS before we dive into Pantheon? Yes, sir. I noticed that Pantheon is the only uh, desktop listed. Does that mean it just doesn't exist in the repositories for when you install this? You can't change from that at all? So you are pretty, you are fairly locked into Pantheon. Let me say it that way. And that's pretty much by design. Um, that goes back to kind of their strong aesthetic um, that they want to have for their particular distribution. They really, really, really want you to utilize Pantheon and really, really, um, kind of utilize it the way that they envisioned. Um, which isn't a bad thing, it's not a good thing, it's just a description of how they feel about it, right? Um, so, uh, in any event, yeah, it's, um, I'm not gonna say it's impossible to put other desktop environments on there, but um, I will say you will run into barriers and challenges uh, very quickly, is what I would say. Mm -hmm. um, you can think of Pantheon's elementary as like Internet Explorer it, it's yeah. Built by default, you could replace it. You might want to replace it, but it's built for that. Yeah, exactly. That that's actually a very apt analogy. It really is. Um, yeah, I mean, it it really is. IE is to Windows, is Pantheon is to Elementary OS. Yes, sir. In the back. So he said that it's he he talked about being locked into one desktop environment. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering, are any of the distros that you mentioned before? Can you like get the distro but without a desktop environment where it's just the command line? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely you can. Okay. Absolutely you can. As a matter of fact, uh, most modern distributions will offer, um, usually it's uh, considered like a, a minimal install or something like that where you will basically just get the terminal. And then from there you can add whatever desktop environment you like. Um, if you, a lot of times most distributions will either on their websites or something of the like give you instructions on how to add certain types of environments and whatnot. But for most distributions, the sky is pretty close to the limit. Um, obviously, you're gonna run into different challenges based on what you're trying to install, and if it's something that they, they the distribution, focus on or not. But yeah, you'd be in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I'm going to dive into Pantheon, because uh, Pantheon. So this is a screenshot I did. So I, did, I actually did like a, a recent little unreview of elementary OS and it was very basic. But um, this was it basically on, based on 1804. It had what, a 415 kernel. Um, you know, as I mentioned, it's GTK based. Um, you know, uh, but this is basically what it looks like. I mean, this is, th this is what you're getting. Um, so that's why I joke earlier, like when at a first glance, you're like, oh, that's Mac, right? No, but it sure puts you in the mindset, right? Um, and a lot of that's by design. Um, so some people love that aesthetic, some people absolutely despise that aesthetic. But it is what it is, and that's the vision. And that's okay. Um, but it's not very resource intensive. Um, it's very slick. Um, it is one of the most polished desktops I've ever seen. And uh, you know the, the vision is very clear of what they're trying to put out there, and it's if you were using a Mac, come over here. You know, the water's just fine. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm gonna get hit so it hard. It kind of looks like a cross between the Mac and uh, and GNOME. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Which is which is its GTK roots coming out? Absolutely. I, you're you're you are spot on with that. It really does. Um, but yeah, they they put a ton of work into it, and it looks fantastic. So. I, I have nothing but good things to say about this particular desktop in life. It's really good. But, yeah, so uh, I think there was, what, there was one more, I think? Yeah, Solus. Solus, that's right. So let me hop back to that real quick. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. So Solus 4. So it's built from scratch and optimized for the desktop. Um, 
It also released when it's ready. Um, there was a running joke uh, in the community because it was 3.9999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
Uh, we got time for that. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, what? Still be waiting for your slides. I was just going to say, you know what? It's funny you say that. I was going to do a Gen 2 challenge, but, you know, it's been a month and it's still compiling. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, guys, have a great day. Thanks so much for uh, having fun with me here.